Hey guys, welcome to uh, another episode of Crypto Creamers, episode five. I'm featuring NVK. Otherwise known as the developer, creator of the cold card. Best solution for Bitcoin cold storage on the market today. How you doing? Good. Thanks for having me. So, MBK, tell me a little bit about yourself. Like, you know, what what got you into crypto? What what made you fall into the into the rabbit hole? Um, I I was uh, introduced to the Bitcoin white paper that was on slash uh, slash dot in about 2010. Uh, by my uh, business partner and uh, you know it was interesting wasn't sure if it was going to work being you know was following around and then uh, a year or a few months later we decided to create a product Uh, we made a block explorer and then uh, and then sort of fell in love with the technology and created uh, Bitcoin debit cards and payment terminals Um, you know we felt that that was too early for that and uh you know market was sort of growing and then you know we we had a, a multi-sig uh a multi-sig we were essentially like big go before big go and uh you know didn't want to be in the business of holding people's bags or participating in people's bags i i you know i like this project because of the uncensorable privacy of it right so uh, yeah, so once we closed that project, um, you know, we created Open Dime, which is a sort of a bare asset. So it's essentially a Bitcoin USB stick uh, that you can just transfer between people, and there is no trace. Uh, it's super private, uh, and you don't have to really understand Bitcoin to use it. I'm a huge uh, fan, and I'm a huge fan, by the way. I love that product. A, it's a fun little device. Uh, so. At around like so yeah so a few years ago we were sort of looking at the hardware wallets in the market and uh, um, none of them were uh, scratching my itch right like none of them were sort of sol- solving like the problem how I wanted to solve so we told you know a bunch of Bitcoiners we know that we were thinking about making a wallet then if people wanted one it was not really sort of even meant to be a, a, a product for sale, kind of. Um, you know, and we described what we were making and a lot of people sort of enjoyed it. Uh, so we made a, a, a big batch for, for all these friends and for the people that wanted to buy. Uh, and it seemed like the market really wanted. So we decided to make a, a bunch more and keep on improving the product. Um, Let me ask you something. I saw the other day on one of your tweets, it says that CoinKite is not a startup. Could you go in depth a little bit about that? So, so yeah, so a few years ago, well, many years ago now, we sort of uh, explored the, 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 the standard, more normal sort of like path of a startup, right? I had been in different startups before, um, had, had exit, some stuff and uh, and and a few years ago we sort of decided that uh, we didn't want to be like a startup like a normal startup right we 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 know how to make products we've had a lot of customers before um so we've decided to essentially self-fund and and be just a old school profitable business where we make stuff, people buy the stuff, we make a product, we reinvest the money into making newer versions, more security, more features, that kind of stuff. So, so, sorry to sorry to interrupt you, but you're you're talking about because because we, we got cut off for a second. Um, you're talking about how Coin Kite is not your traditional um startup is that what you're talking about yeah we we, we're not you know most of the companies in this space um you know are on the vc treadmill uh 
Which is, which is, listen, I, I am not against that. Like, you know, venture capital is fantastic. It allows you to have a lot of different businesses that wouldn't be possible otherwise. But it's also possible to build a business where we're not in a treadmill. Uh, we're sort of trying to, to create a, a sort of like a, a merge of essentially trying to, to monetize open source for the sake of paying our bills and developing technology further, right? I understand, uh, I understand. Especially with hardware, right? Like you can't, you can't just be a open source project uh, on GitHub with hardware. Somebody has to actually spend money, um, you know, doing research and development, creating prototypes, upfronting the hardware cost production, all that stuff, right? So we're trying to find a medium ground between being essentially an open source project and, and, and managing to sort of, you know, have money to, uh, to, to, to make it go forward. That's interesting because you never, you usually never hear about, you know, with the startup culture nowadays. Yeah. I, I mean, one thing that many people may not understand is that like hardware has, a lot of upfront cost, right? Like you essentially have to bank the production before you even have sales. I mean, l l listen, bro, you're, you're talking to someone who exactly. minds. So yeah. I know what you're talking about. Yeah, and, and, and then, you know, Bitcoin is still a fairly small market, right? Comparing to consumer electronics. Oh, uh, absolutely. So, um, so, so yeah, so we, we sort of like, figured out some ways to, to make that happen and, and, and remain sort of like an open source project, which is sort of what we want to do with our lives. <laughs> makes sense. Makes sense. And uh, do you have any other products uh, coming down or yeah, are you not? We, we are, yeah, I know we, we totally are working on, uh, on a couple other products. Um, it's just, it's, it's a bit early to talk about them. Uh, just because, you know, hype actually is a detriment to productivity. <laughs> I understand. So, um, just so you know, uh, that I wasn't lying, that I've owned every single hardware wallet that ever existed. <laughs> uh, Ledger. I mean, and then the big boy the new ledger whatever anyways out of all of those i'm just not showing off but out of all of those um as as 1990s feel that it you know that that i that i feel when i'm operating it i've never felt more secure with the cold, with the with the cold card yeah i i think uh I don't know. So I'm, I'm a ham radio operator, right? And, and like, I like knobs and buttons. You know, it's just very satisfying to have <laughs> those things. So, uh, you know, and I, I wanted to create a harder wallet that essentially does never have to be connected to a computer. I, I find that you fail if you have to, if you have to, you can with code card, but if you have to, connect to, to start and operate a hardware wallet uh, connected to a computer. I mean, what's the point, right? I mean, I want but, a device that can be used completely air gapped. But could, could you go into a little bit more detail as to what are the risks of, you know, connecting um, the cold card to a computer? Well, no, it's not just cold card, right? It's any device. So, the idea, the idea behind sort of making these things very secure is it's called defense in depth, right? So essentially you want to keep on adding layers that make it more expensive and more difficult for an attacker to do anything. Yeah. Nothing is perfect, right? Nothing of will ever be perfect. It, 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 everything has a vulnerability, absolutely. Exactly. Yeah. So we, we started with that design in mind, right? So we use a secure element, uh, but we keep everything open source. 
Uh, so you, you can audit the code. Uh, we don't use any closed source primitives to do any Bitcoin calculation. Um, and then, um, for example, let's say that there is a flaw in the secure element that we wouldn't know about, right? So what we do against that is we encrypt your seed with the only provable encryption known to man uh, that is foolproof, which is one time pad, uh, and we put it inside the secure element. So, and it's very old in encryption uh, uh, schema. And so, so your, your seed is encrypted inside the secure element. So that's like a huge improvement in terms of physical security. Um, and then um, one of the best attack vectors that there is, is connecting something to the hardware wallet, right? I mean, like you have to attack it somehow. <laughs> yeah, so, but, but, but what I'm trying to ask is like, okay, so you guys have the, the you know, the, the secure trip inside, like, is there any possible way for, you know, uh, a bad actor to, you know, um, upload code into the, the cold card? Well, so the way cold card operates is for you to, to change the firmware, right? You have to have the pin. So without the pin, they can't change the code on the device. Okay. I understand. Right? So, but let's say somehow they found a flaw somewhere, right? And they did manage to somehow inject something in there. Your seed's still encrypted inside of the secure element. So that's a huge thing. Now, let's say that everything is like, somehow they managed to get all the way in there, right? Now, if the device is not connected to any device, they can't really retrieve it remotely, right? So one of the biggest problems with connecting a hardware wallet to a computer is having a remote attack. Because chances are, most of the time, they're not gonna manage to get inside your house, inside your safe, or inside whatever to get the device, right? They're gonna compromise your computer and they're gonna try to attack you that way. So if your device never touches a computer to begin with, it can't really be yeah, remotely it, attacked. It, it, it's completely air gapped. I I, uh, I have a, I have an old MacBook Air, and um, I use it for, you know, storing my storing my uh, my seeds or whatever. But I completely removed uh, the the Bluetooth, the the Wi-Fi thing. I literally opened up the computer and I took out everything, yeah, so that I couldn't connect it. to the computer. Yeah. So you know, again, it's all about retrievability, right? So even if you do manage to to be compromised, if the device is not connected anywhere, it's very hard for an attacker to get it to get the the secret. Understand, understand. Uh, this is a little, uh, a little off topic, but it relates to me as well. Uh, where are you from? Uh, uh, Brazil. You're and, Brazil. Uh, I, okay. I live in, you know, Canadian. We're, we're neighbors. That's guess, right. Well, guess you're what? US. Guess what country I'm from? We're neighbors. We're neighbors. Argentina. Mm, uh, bro, come on, dude. <laughs> Uruguay. <sighs> Bro, oh, so far off. <laughs> uh, I can't tell, man. You don't have an accent. What do you mean I don't have an accent? I, I don't I don't hear the Spanish accent from any of the countries. Si te quieres, si te quieres que te hable en español, oh, ya sabes. Sure. Uh, must be Colombia? Oh, close, 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 close. Colombia and Venezuela. Okay, Col yeah, Colombia and Venezuelan accents are... A little yeah, similar, very close. very close, very close. But that's awesome, man. That, that that's that's really cool to hear. Um, what do you feel about like? Obviously, like I don't want you to trash them or anything. But how do you feel about you know uh, Ledger or Trezor? Um, and 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 I'm I'm not trying to ask, I'm not trying to ask you know so that like you know you shit on them or whatever, but how do you feel about how they're doing things? 
I, I think different companies have different philosophies. Um, those, those solutions were not working for me. So I created a solution that works for me. Yeah. Uh, so, I, you know, like the, like the, the ledger team has a lot of like really, really quality people there, uh, especially mm -hmm. on the security side. Um, and, uh, but you know, they, they have a, a more commercial sort of mindset, right? They, they're trying yeah. to create a product that's sort of more commercial. And, and, and you know, like the, the architecture decisions that they made require them to keep part of the source code uh, close, right? It's they're, not a choice, really. They're, they're, they're trying to be the Coinbase of hardware wallets. I, yeah, I, which I, is I, which is you know it, it's uh, it's needed in the market, right? We need many different solutions. So, do you find yourself like a niche product? Um, I I don't really care. Um, <laughs> the benefits I mean, the benefits of not being a startup. Exactly right. I mean, you know, people are buying our products. We are on the third version now. Most people bought the first, the second, and buying the third. Um, you know, we're happy with the level of security in the third version. So we're going to stick with this one for a while um, and sort of put more effort now in the software and in other different hardware. Um, and, uh, and, and in regards to Trezor, I, I think, I think uh, it's a product that's, that had the first mover advantage. It's been in the market for a very long time. Yes. Um, uh, I personally was hoping that uh, their second version was going to be secure. But it wasn't. And, uh, <laughs> you know, it just, again, it, it didn't go with, with how I, I expect the architecture of a hardware wallet to be. Um, so, uh, so, yeah. I mean, you know. Um, no, I, I I really appreciate your insight, and um, and let me let me ask you something. I know it's a it's a little bit delicate, so obviously don't answer any questions that you don't feel comfortable with. But um, how is the manufacturing side? Like, how do you trust your manufacturers? Right. So. We use, because we have a secure micro, right? We can actually trace it, that. It, wait, wait, wait. Put, let, me, let me pause you. Let me pause you for a second. Uh, could, you, could you please explain to our audience what a secure sure. micro is? So essentially there is, there is like, there's micros that are designed to the security and there's micros that are general purpose, right? There's many other types, but in this case, what a, these two are sort of important, right? So general purpose micros, are used on everything, right? Like microwaves, toasters, trezors, uh, you know, like, uh, like kids' toys, whatever, right? Everything has those. And those were not designed to keep secrets. So they can be very easily attacked. Okay. Uh, it, it's just a, it's a design choice, right? Because there's compromises that you have to make. So and what... Then, Sorry, sorry. I'm just yeah. trying to. I'm just trying to simplify it for everybody. And, and then, I, yeah, yeah. Let me. So, so, and then there is secure elements, right? So, secure micros. Secure micros are are often uh, they have built-in sort of security measures, right? So they will make sure that you don't leak seeds through the power when you're calculating them. They're, they're going to make sure that, you know, you can't just use a radio to try to change them. They're going to make sure that, you know, if you try to, to peel the top of them, to try to read them with an electromicroscope, it doesn't, it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. uh, they're going to have trip wires inside. So, so it's kind of like, you know, Rambo at the bush on, on, on First Blood. You know, yeah. he puts all the booby traps around yeah, and if you yeah, try yeah. to do anything, it's like, you know, it destroys, right? So, <laughs> so like a secure micro works like that. And, and, and that's why you have to use them to keep secrets safe. Okay. Uh, so I got, I got some Rambo security in my uh, cold card. Exactly. That's what you're saying. So what's cool about them too is that they have these things called monotonic counters. And 
these are essentially one-way counters. They can only count up. They can never be cheated or moved down. So for example, when you, when you, when you put in the amount of attempts at making a pin, right? It's, you can't cheat. But it's like, wait, I'm, I'm, I'm terribly sorry, NVK. Um, do you mind simplifying that, you know, sure. so, so that the, so that our audience so, understands. So if a normal chip, right? Yes. You're going to have a function there. That's going to say like, let's say you create your code and you put it in there and, and then you're going to say, is my pin right? The device says no. One attempt. Is my pin right? The device says no. Two attempts. Is my pin right? The device says no. Three attempts and, and, and locks itself, right? The mm -hmm. problem is this. If the micro is not a security micro, you can try to get in there and change that logic so that it could possibly skip the pin. Right? Oh, okay. And, and, and that's why you only have the 13 pin limit. Right. So, but with a secure micro, you have this thing, this monotonic counter that I'm talking about that you can't go and change the counter. You can't cheat. It's okay. in silicon. Like it, it's, it's like, it's very like you'd have to change the silicon. It's, 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 it. it's, it's hardware based. I, I, I exactly. understand what you're saying. Okay. Uh, so basically what you're saying, just to summarize it is that the security is not software based. It's hardware based. So yes. in order for you to, you know, uh, change the, the hardware, you would literally need to open it up to uh, make the necessary changes to uh, attack the device. However, yes. um, I'll, I'll, let, I'll let MVK explain this um, uh, about the, the safeguards and the, and the transparency of the actual device. Yeah, so, so you'd have to change the hardware itself, but those secure chips have physical security too. So if you try to open it to change it, they break and they destroy your seed. Uh, so, so in terms of manufacturability, right? So essentially we have a, a money, it's like a money, uh, um, a void evident bag, right? So the devices come in these bags that if you try to open, it shows it was open before. Uh, the devices have clear plastic cases so you can inspect for any weirdness going on in there. I saw, I saw. Um, we trace the, 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 the secure elements, serial numbers uh, within the factory. Um, we, we, we also have anti-phishing uh, measures so that the device splits the pin in two. And then, so if you are being, say, if you are given a fake one to try to steal your pin, you would know because they don't know which two words they're supposed to show to you. Exactly. So you don't give them the rest of the pin. Um, we have, uh, so we have the, the, the air gap solution with the micro SD card for transportation of data. Uh, you have, um, um, what else? So we have the genuine caution lights. The, the caution lights, the red light is actually driven by the secure element, not by software. Uh, so if something happens there, if it's not correctly, uh, um, functioning it will turn red um what else uh, you don't need a computer to upgrade the firmware either um you can function just off of a battery um we have now this uh, countdown system where you can set up in a way that uh every time to log in it's gonna force you to wait and you choose the wait time uh, so that helps duress. We have duress pins. We have a brick me pin. So if somebody forces you to put your pin, you can just put this pin that bricks the device. So, so, so what, what, what made you so paranoid? It, listen, hold on. Let me backtrack. I'm paranoid as hell, right? I never felt at ease with Ledger, uh, Trezor, or any other hardware wallet, right? The moment that yours came out, I felt at ease, right? I, I literally, so it, it was recommended to only roll 
a hundred dice, a uh, hundred dice to to ensure entropy. But uh, I was a maniac, and I and I, I think I rolled nine hundred seventy five, just, just just to play it safe. Um, but what made you so paranoid? To- uh, well, I mean, so I, I think it's it's a uh, it's less of a paranoid and more of a thinking it through kind of thing. I think I've been around Bitcoiners for long enough now to to have heard of a lot of different interesting stories, and and, uh, um, and, and we've seen a lot of things through the years, um, you know, to like users we had or um, uh, and a lot of, uh, uh, um, uh, well, anyways, a, a lot of things that we've seen in the market happen. Um, and, and, you know, I grew up in Brazil, where we have physical security considerations. Where in Brazil? I know uh, Brazil. Sao Paulo. I know. Oh, Sao Paulo, of course. I've, and, I've li- uh, I lived there like six months. So, you know, it, it's, a, it's a safe place, but it's not a safe place, right? And, and all, all of Latin America, you always have to keep an, keep an eye out. Yeah. When so you're walking in the street. You know, growing up that way and sort of working through uh, hardware and having it, you know, we, we, we PCI certified our hardware before and on none of this, like the previous uh, debit machines we had. And, you know, we've just been around for, for some time. And we took a lot of community feedback into the things that people wanted uh, in their hardware wallets. And, and we sort of iterated through, through each of them and added them as a feature. That's awesome. That's awesome. Uh, where do you see the future of cryptocurrency in five years? This is t- complete speculation, but I have to ask you. Um, well, I mean, this market is going to grow. <laughs> and, and no, no, no. But like, please elaborate on that. Like, what what makes you think it's going to grow? I, I think it's a. Uh, I don't know. I think I've been around enough, long enough now to sort of be comfortable with, with its, its trending growth. Um, see, the world is going to increasingly become more surveillance capitalism and, and, and have a lot more distress around the redistribution of wealth and, uh, and attempt sort of capital controls, right? Um, what we have currently as, as democracies, as, as monetary policies, um, you know, they're not necessarily terrible. They have served the world reasonably okay in the last 100 years. You, you know, the world is a better place than it was 100 years ago. Um, but I, I think that uh, as monetary policies fail, uh, with this harder capital controls uh, and, and with the internet where people have freedom of thought, uh, people will want freedom of transaction, right? And, and, I, and I think this, these two things are sort of lined up for an epic battle <laughs> in, you know, in 10, 20, 50 years from now. So as people want to, to, to move their wealth, without permission uh, and have like real privacy, uh, it, you know, there is no other place but for Bitcoin to grow. Awesome. Yeah, I love that answer and, and I completely agree with you. And uh, one last question and then we'll get to the most important question of the, of the podcast. Why did you decide to make coin kite only Bitcoin only? I, I don't have time for shit coins. It's a, you know, unless see like shit coins are great. If you are part of the scam or early in the scam. Or you're, you're trading and yeah. you're playing I mean, the, sure, the if lottery. You know, if you're in the Bitcoin, if you're in the crypto casino, that's fine too. The, the crypto casino. I love that. I use that right? too. But the reality is that everything has, a, has a, an opportunity cost, right? I mean, look at our competitors, right? I mean, they, they incorporated thousands of shitcoins and, and they haven't really innovated in, you know, years. 
because you know things take from your time right if you support shit coins in your products you have to review that code even if it's not you who write it even if you pay a third party you still have to review it right for a security device so that's time you could be working on more features and more interesting things uh it, and unfortunately i mean i i still haven't seen any shit coin that adds value right i mean th there is nothing really that interesting happening out there i agree uh, most of the interesting stuff is happening in Bitcoin. So I, is, I, is that, I, I mean, that way? Look, I, I, I'm a little bit different because I mine for a living, right? So I, you know, I mine the coin that's most profitable, but obviously, you know, I sell it for, for uh, the big boy, if you catch my drift. Yeah. Um, anyways, uh, last question of the sesh. NVK, what is your favorite ice cream? Uh, think like a mango gelato. Mango gelato. Okay. You know what's funny is that every single developer we've interviewed, they always tell us some crazy answer. And if it was me being interviewed, all I would have to, all, all I would say is, uh, chocolate. <laughs> right. Um, anyways, listen, thank you so much for your time. Uh, I really appreciate the interview. If you guys like what you see, uh, don't forget to like and subscribe. it down in the description below.